This is the first video of a new speculative series dedicated to the possible scenarios of World War III. I thought long and hard if anything like this should actually be done because it is such a terrible subject that it is hard to even think about it. So I finally decided that this series may be useful because the coverage of this subject on YouTube is abundant and there are some excellent videos out there. But they often don't go into some aspects that I believe are essential to understand what may happen. All these videos will be necessarily highly speculative, so you may let me know if you agree with me in the comments below. In this series, I won't focus on the international politics. I'm not trying to tell who is the good guy and who is the bad guy, who is the aggressor and who is the defender. I just consider the different diverging interests that the parts may have. In war, in every war, when the friction becomes high, so high to trigger the hostilities, there must be an underlying cause. And in every war, the purpose of the war is removing the underlying cause and this determines the war objectives and the strategies that are enacted to reach it. For our speculation, we are supposing that two coalitions are going to confront at global level. On one side, the USA with the NATO and the traditional Pacific allies will form the Western coalition. On the other side, China and Russia, with some minor allies, will form the Eastern Coalition. In this case, Eastern and Western do not reflect a Eurocentric view of the world, but in this case, they are only conventional names. I have chosen this scenario on purpose, because it is the most complex from a military perspective. A complete coverage of the friction causes is beyond the scope of this series, but the nature of those frictions determines the objective that each side is pursuing. Drawing on the experience of the recent years, we may postulate that the Western Alliance will be pursuing a regime change in Russia and China. Russia will pursue the removal of the NATO from the vicinity of its borders, and China will win if it will remove the possibility for the US to manage the communications lines with the Middle East, East Africa and Europe. Many are convinced that the confrontation among nuclear powers will inevitably go nuclear. And indeed, there are good reasons for believing so. For example, the NATO never considered a no-first-use option because actually because it was relying on nuclear weapons to counter the Soviet numeric su conventional superiority. Soviet plans to invade West Europe included nuclear weapons from the beginning of the hostilities. I, on the contrary, believe that there is almost no possibility for a conflict to go nuclear, and this is for several reasons. Probably the most important factor preventing a nuclear war is nuclear retaliation. This is also known as the MAD. And actually we have one precedence. In World War II, chemical weapons were hardly used, despite the fact that all the sides were equipped and ready to do so. The fear of retaliation was just too high. Chemical weapons were employed only when the opponent did not possess the same weapons. For example, it happened in China during the Japanese invasion. The MAD doctrine, which ensured the equilibrium of power during the Cold War, is still an effective stabilizer. But there is another element. The perspective of starting a nuclear war for real is never taken lightly by anyone. I doubt that even order a military man would merrily initiate a nuclear exchange. There have been already a couple of examples of Russian officers who refused to follow the procedures and start a retaliation upon a mistaken report of a nuclear strike. 
So I believe that the order of initiating a nuclear war will not be executed. And even if it was executed, it wouldn't last long. The part of the chain of command, uh, political or military, not directly responsible for the attack, would feverish contact the target opponent, likely setting out the attack authors as a small bunch of out-of-control madmen who initiated the nuclear war and imploring not to retaliate. The same party would likely do everything to remove the attackers from power, even at the cost of starting a civil war. Better a civil war than a nuclear war. Actually, I believe that the first side to use nuclear weapons has lost the war. Finally, despite the form of government, every government needs consent. Even the harshest dictatorship is on board with time if a majority of the population doesn't approve it or it is at least neutral toward it. Whoever starts a nuclear holocaust is guaranteed to lose all the consent and consequently the power. For, so for the purpose of our speculation, no nuclear weapons will be used. Most likely nuclear forces will be on high alert all the time, ready to react, but they will wait for an order that is not going to come. Impact on the nature of the war of disposition about the use of nuclear weapon is obviously huge. Both sides will be extremely cautious not to bring the opponent too close to military annihilation to avoid the use of nuclear weapons as the last resort. A strictly enforced set of rules of engagement and limitations will be put in place. The two sides will resort to attacking the opponent's military forces and its economy in the hope of causing a collapse of the will to fight. We may expect a high level of asymmetric warfare, psyops and cyber warfare. This is clearly the recipe for a long, conventional and inconclusive war. It may be expected that the hostilities will go on for a long time without any of the sides gaining a real advantage. The end may come either from tiredness of the public opinions that at the point negate the consent to the prosecution of the war or from some form of asymmetric warfare hitting hard uh, the respective governments. This mechanism works in two directions. Attacking the civilian population, for example, may dent the will to fight at the receiving end, but may also reduce the level of consent on the side dealing the blow. Attacks that may cause severe pollution or environmental disasters like sinking an oil tanker or attacking a nuclear plant, well, they will probably be frowned upon on both sides by all the public opinions. Even in this case, we have a precedent for this, and it is the Vietnam War. The USA, for fear of escalation outside the region, adopted a strict series of rules which prevented a total war against the source of the opponent's military power. While the United States had a decisive military superiority, these restraints reduced its effectiveness to just a fraction of its capacity. And in this conflict it could be even worse because the distance in military power separating the two sides is considerably lower than in Vietnam, and maybe in some cases even non-existent. So, to sum up, the framework of our speculation exercise will be two big coalitions, no nuclear weapons, and strict rules of engagement. All of this will affect and condition the use of military power. In the next video, we will try to better understand the military capabilities of each side. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.